episode starts simply enough with Tyr and Becca holding the fort while the rest of the crew is dispersed throughout the galaxy is looking for spare parts. I can't help but point out how forced this premise is. We want Becca and Tyr to have alone time for the B-plot, but why is Becca on maintenance duty and Dylan doing the trading in the Maru? Doesn't the other way make sense? I suppose you could say Dylan doesn't trust Becca and Tyr to not just steal whatever they need, but... We're pretty deep into season one at this point. Dylan has broken off with Trance, while Rev and Harper are Sir is not appearing in this film, but he's interrupted by an attack. Trance finds a button dropped by the attackers. Dylan wakes up somewhere friendly looking. This lady is asking a whole bunch of weird questions, but finally nabs Dylan's attention. Don't you tell us about that mission? I don't know what you're talking about. Really? Then how did you get this? Something so illuminating demands a flashback. We finally meet Admiral Stark, who has been name-dropped throughout the series. She's the head of Argosy Special Operations before the fall, and thus Dylan's boss. She's here to offer him a mission. The only thing she can tell him is that five billion lives can be saved, and that none of them have to die if the mission goes correctly. Dylan finally realizes that this is an interrogation, and only gives his rank and serial number. For the record, this was information too nerdy even for the Andromeda wiki. Yes, I bothered transcribing the whole thing once. Uh, we do hear one name, the Great Compass, the leader of this planet. We get another flashback, Dylan and Rade. Oh, did I spoil that for you? Have gotten the details. Extradite the ruler of the planet Mobius, President Farron. He's apparently been starting a number of crazy wars against his neighbors. Rade is incensed. Mobius isn't a commonwealth world, and neither are the worlds he's been attacking. Dylan is more interventionist, saying that the entire sector is at risk so long as Farron is in power. We meet Mr. May, their contact on Mobius. He's Farron's architect, and he runs down a list of great works he's designed, though Rade isn't in as good a mood as Dylan and Mr. May are. They want to shoot kill him and save us the trouble. Kill him? I was told that this the truth, which is that this is a non-violent extraction, correct? If you say so. Back in the present, Dylan has a visitor. The Great Compass himself has come to oversee the interrogation. Mr. April. The new tree. How? Thanks for the spoilers, Dylan. Venitri here took the time to uncover the two agents who he worked with on Mobius. He apparently felt a loss when Dylan was pronounced dead. But it turns out the assassination of Sebastian Lee back on Castalia was something of a news story, and word of Dylan's return from the dead finally reached Venitri. Well, we can't let that go without another flashback. Apparently, Farron's castle was built according to specs from DuckTales, because, in addition to pheromone sensors that vaporize anything they don't recognize, he had Venetri install this checkerboard full of landmines. While we're here, Venetri shares his backstory. He submitted a design for one of Farron's monuments, and won. Farron was so pleased with the results, he kept Venetri around. Venetri, of course, wasn't without ambition. He says he finally realized Farron was a lost cause when he presented his glorious master vision, the Cathedral of Light. But Farron smashed the model with his bare hands. It is interesting that it wasn't the millions dead or the unjust wars, but Venetri's tiny little bubble that makes him uncomfortable. Although hell, we just had a whole election about people not caring about suffering and death as long as their job is fine. There's something of Entrapta in him in that regard, and seeing as though he would literally name himself the Great Compass centuries down the line, it's not too unfair to note the instability in his worldview. Roddy's temper remains short. What do you think, Mr. May? I, uh, uh, I'm an architect. I build things. Walls, ceilings. All I want is peace, sanity, cathedrals. What you want, what we all want, is to exert our will over others. Our team meets a guard whom Venetri tries to bribe, but the arrival of another guard spoils the plan, and they end up killing the guards. 
Two guys just doing a thankless job if the people who guard the presidential palace are so open to bribery. But this is also a recording in the future, and we see it's been edited to remove Venetri. But whether he's done so out of shame, madness, or just a desire to see himself as a man who does good things, the show leaves open for us. The interrogation gets worse, even putting Dylan through a fake execution just to mentally exhaust him. Lucky for him, the cavalry arrives. Dylan Hunt, Commonwealth Captain HE 5095C21922. Transgemini, Acting Search and Rescue Officer number. Six. The episode thus far has been grim and, frankly, a bit melodramatic, with even Sorbo delivering his lines like a stage play. But Trance is in peak form, being just. So adorable. I had all sorts of jobs. But the one I was really good at was, well, finding things. Finding things? Yeah. You know, first I would find things, and then I would take them and give them to people who wanted it. You were a thief? No. Thieves have bad intentions. I never do. Oh. But I am going to steal you now. It elevates the episode from here on with this double act. Trance wants to flee, but Dylan is insistent he confront Venetri. But we finally see how deep his madness really runs. He's been growing clones for body parts to keep himself going. This does raise a curious question about the timing. We heard that interrogator girl was uplifted by Venetri, sponsoring her education, for being a descendant of one of the guards he helped kill. But Venetri has clearly been in power for a very long time based on this immortality. Why did it take him 200 years to find her? But this has now become personal for Dylan. Seeing that Venetri is even worse than Farron was, he feels the need to correct the mistake. So they go on the warpath. But of course, the door to Venetri's office leads to a flashback. We finally see how Dylan got his wound, shot by Farron, who doesn't get to live long enough to gloat. This steals Dylan's resolve, but Trance argues with him. She insists that the only thing that Dylan can control are his intentions. No matter how many bullets he shoots, he can't control the situation. This is the same character flaw pointed out by Tyr on multiple occasions. Dylan is a control freak. He wants the entire universe to operate on his lines. The fact that it's Trance telling him down here, whom we have established in the series so far as having strong psychic powers and perhaps even the ability to influence those outcomes, is what I think really sells this dynamic. It has been apparent, through hints, subtle and not so subtle, that Trance is something of a puppet master, but the conviction that she tells Dylan point blank that life is chaos, control is an illusion, really adds a lot of much needed depth to her character. Venetri is in full meltdown mode when we finally see him, but he is yet balanced within his madness. I have my truth. You're a liar. You've always been a liar. I never lied to you. You said it would be non-violent. You lied. You said Farron would be taken to trial. You lied. You said the gods would live. You lied. That was a mistake. And you know it. See, when Farron was killed, the Commonwealth installed Venetri as a transitory overseer. But this was only two years before the Battle of Hephaestus, when the Commonwealth collapsed before they could back Venetri's open elections. He was forced to crack down on coups and assassins. And Venetri finally cuts to the heart of what has been eating away at him and what has actually been bothering Dylan this whole time. As for you? I don't deserve anything. Why not? You said if the mission's done right, no one dies. People die. We analyzed all the possible outcomes of your mission, Commander. It was always a possibility that Farron would end up dead. Frankly, we were fine with that. Roddy was right. Fools and hypocrites. Trance tries to argue for Dylan, but... Everything I have and everything I am came out of what happened here. By accepting the Andromeda, I sanctioned it. Trance argues that while Dylan might feel shame over the circumstances of his acquisition of the Andromeda, that the good he is doing isn't erased by the past. But Dylan offers Venetri a way out. 
He's skeptical, but with some clever architect framing, he convinces him that a blueprint that involves the dissidents can be left in the hands of the builders. And everyone gets a happy ending. I looked for you. I found out where you were. I traveled to where you were, and I got you out. That's your entire report. You wanted something more? No. The most obvious allegory here is interventionism. As established, Mobius was not part of the Commonwealth, and the region it was destabilizing was not Commonwealth. Farron was basically a Saddam Hussein figure, outside the normal channels of civilized society, with neighbors who were the same. But there are other readings inside that core. There's a small takeaway for colonialism in there, showing us how Dylan is shamed by what got him the Andromeda, but his endeavor to use it in a just and fair way to save lives and preserve peace is declared to be a good thing. That's admittedly a little more dated, that how a thing is acquired is divorced from how it is used. The episode argues for a more indirect reparations approach, that if no evil is committed with ill-gotten gains, then justice will result from the moral arc of the universe. Compounded, of course, with the detail that even if you enter a situation with the best of intentions, things might still spiral out of control. Essentially, arguing in favor of the ameliatory power of ill-gotten gains. Context being what it is, let's remember this is pre-September 11th, so if it feels juvenile, that's because it literally is. The idea that trans can make such a simple declaration that it is Dylan's present intentions that count, superseding all context, isn't an idea really worth dignifying these days. Now, that might still be your conclusion, absolutely, and I think in general I do fall in that side of the discussion, but taken on its own blind merits, the same could be said if Dylan had acquired the Andromeda via a mission he needed to enslave millions of people, or exterminate millions of people. This idea needs much more context and thought. Trance's own argument, of course, provides some key context. You mentioned Farron. Who was he? He's a very bad man. What happened to him? He was killed. It's an accident. So you're going to repeat on purpose with Venetri what happened by accident with Farron? I suppose I am. What makes you think that's going to work any better? Even if we do get ahead due to past actions, we can still make everyone's situation better if we keep trying for the positive outcome. It won't always come. It sucks when we try and it fails, but we keep trying. Where this moral message falls flat is... with Dylan. The episode attempts to frame Venetri as a foil to Dylan, a man who runs from his role in the past, but it consumes him. Dylan decides to face his bad decisions head on and ultimately rises above them. But Dylan probably hasn't thought about this backwards dung heap of a world since he was last here. This is more of a Kirk and Khan situation where one party has been consumed with what has happened on that mission, but the other has merrily sailed the stars, and I doubt has had many a sleepless night due to his activities. The dichotomy falls apart because we just don't believe that Dylan has thought about his responsibility until it inconvenienced him. Forced perspective gets a mark of optional from me. Mobius will become an important, but off-screen, member of the Commonwealth, and none of the characters we meet today will be making any future appearance. Mobius becomes the spy network for the new Commonwealth, a fitting adaptation of the culture they've developed. And while the ideas the episode raises are complicated, this episode definitely falls into the preachy side of its morality play. It does pay some lip service to one competing point, but this is an issue with several sides to it, and a majority of them are just ignored so we can wrap up our 42 minutes in peace. A lot of time was dedicated to the Becca and Tyr subplot, who basically spent their whole time on the Andromeda, firing enough sexual tension at each other to bend a light, which is so engaging this is the first time I'm bringing it up. Don't get me wrong, time with Tyr is always time well spent, but he could have standed to be Sir not appearing in this film, with the sheer volume of unspoken sides to the moral quandary in Dylan's part of the episode. Speaking of brainwashed, let's talk about Dylan and how he acts as a mirror to the Commonwealth this episode. See, all those criticisms we made about Dylan contributed to the disasters this episode. He is a control freak. 
He thought he could rely on Admiral Stark's assurance that they could extract Farron without getting anyone killed, because in his mind, the Commonwealth, through he, can do anything, can save anyone, can always do the right thing. The Admiralty itself is a control freak, thinking that they can just remove Farron and simply change over the power structure of Mobius to something more benign towards them. Good job. The Commonwealth took its ubiquity for granted, and because of that, people died. But hey, you know what? We do have an organization in Andromeda that does try to do just that. Let's meet them properly next. By divine grace, I touch the shadow and reveal the light. In light, there is truth. In truth, freedom from dark things. I am the darkness, become light. I am the darkness, become the truth. Quite a renaissance man, Tyr. Gourmet chef, mercenary killer. I took it up because a former employer of mine appreciated fine dining. When he refused to pay me for one of my jobs, I prepared him a tiramisu laced with strychnine. As I recall, he quite enjoyed it. For precisely... 12 seconds. <laughs> 